Hey, Bridget here. So as y'all know, this is one of my favorite times of year in the DMV area. And like many of y'all, I am busy planning weekend getaways to make sure that I can soak in all the area has to offer. That's why I'm so excited to plug one of Congress's latest national heritage areas in Southern Maryland's Calvert, Charles, St. Mary's, and Southern Prince George counties. So discover the area's heritage, scenic waterfront, and countless breweries, distilleries, and wineries. Learn more and discover where time and tide meet at DestinationSouthernMaryland.com. Today on CityCast DC, DC's mayor is due on the Hill this week for a hearing where she is almost certain to sit there as a line of congressional Republicans lambaste her city in not necessarily accurate terms. For those of us who haven't been summoned by the committee, is it worth paying attention to anyway? Reporter Mark Seagraves is here to explain why we should. Today is Monday, May 15th. I'm Michael Schaefer, and here's what DC is talking about. All right, so Mark, I have a confession to make, which is like I'm a DC native and work in local news or have worked in local news for a lot of my career. And I have like no interest in watching when DC officials go up for congressional hearings of the sort that is going to happen Tuesday. That it uh, is a bunch of uh, members of Congress who don't represent DC grandstanding, saying sort of shaming things. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of interest in getting to the bottom of anything. And there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of consequence other than like making us cringe and feel sort of embarrassed to live here. Am I wrong about that? Is this a thing I should be paying attention to? No, if they didn't pay me to do it, I wouldn't do it either. (laughs) I don't want to be flipped. I mean, it's important because, look, Congress has the ability to or the responsibility of approving or disapproving every D.C. law that is passed by the mayor and the 13 members of the D.C. Council. And for years, we just ignored that because they didn't really do anything. They never overturned anything. And it had been decades since they'd done that. Well, that just happened. And it wasn't just any law. It was the complete rewrite of the district's criminal code, which is more than 100 years old. And it has huge implications for everyone who lives in, works in, and visits the District of Columbia. So in that respect, the fact that we have a much more activist Congress who wants to play a role in local D.C. politics is very important and should be followed closely by everybody in the country. Because even if you're not a D.C. resident, you're an American citizen. These are your elected representatives who are spending their time and energy probably doing stuff that you don't even know or really want. That's not why you sent them to Congress uh, in in the first place. You're right. There's a lot of grandstanding. There's a lot of people who simply want to get, you know, their five minutes on TV, on C-SPAN or whatnot, and promote their agenda and do what they do for their own personal purposes. Not really any interest in helping or informing the residents of the District of Columbia. So the hearings, you're right. Not a lot of consequence, nothing but political theater, uh, but Congress taking an activist role in legislating D.C. laws, uh, that's a big, big deal. So uh, this time, the mayor's going, and she's joined by the police chief, Robert Conti, who has announced his retirement, and the city administrator, Kevin Donahue. What is the significance of having Conti there anyway? Well, only Mayor Bowser was invited by the committee. So only Mayor Bowser is actually going to testify. She'll be staffed uh, by the city administrator and by the chief of police. They won't give an opening statement. They'll simply be there to answer questions if any members of Congress want to ask them questions or to provide Mayor Bowser you know, not just that moral support, but you know, just some technical support if they're drilling down into questions that, you know, she doesn't have the exact answer, but the chief or the CA might. Now, my guess is what we'll see is the Democrats, the Jamie Raskins, will ask questions of the chief and the CA to kind of bring them into the conversation. You may see Republican members go after them as well. You know, one can only imagine what some of them will make of the fact that Conti is leaving, right? They made a big deal in the last one about the attrition 
of MPD officers and how low the rank and file is in numbers compared to where they want to be where they once were, they'll probably make a point of, look, you're losing the chief of police and that is going to lead to others leaving. And he's clearly leaving because crime is out of control and he's got a soft on crime council who he disagrees with. And he and the mayor have publicly disagreed with the council on some legislation that governs police accountability and transparency and discipline and whatnot. So so that, that gets to the next question I was going to ask you about, which is they're going to obviously make a big show of crime because it's a thing that they have been, some might say, demagoguing or, or at least flacking a lot. What about Kevin Donahue? You know, the city administrator in previous mayors played a much more prominent role than under Bowser. Why does she want Donahue there? Well, one reason is that in the flow chart of the district government and her administration, he's number two. He used to be deputy mayor for public safety. So he, he's well versed in that. He has that 30,000 foot view where he sees everything and all the other agencies and how they interact with crime. And let's not forget, Mayor Bowser is going into this meeting having lost her most trusted loyal and longtime advisor, former chief of staff and deputy mayor, John Felcecchio, who is now under investigation. This was her go-to guy for everything. And to not have him by her side, I- I'm wondering if he would have been there had he not been jettisoned, as it were. Cold War era defectors sold secrets outside the British embassy on Mass Ave. Allied operatives met at the Mayflower Hotel in 1925 and again in 2010. And odds are there was a spy on your train this morning. With more than 10,000 spies, DC truly is the capital of spycraft. And if you want to understand their secrets, step into their radio transmitting shoes or into James Bond's Aston Martin, you need to visit the International Spy Museum. Located just off the National Mall, the Spy Museum features two floors of exhibits and artifacts. They've got ciphers, submarines, and the actual ice axe that killed Leon Trotsky. While most DC museums discouraged me from touching the artwork, the Spy Museum gave me an undercover identity and tested my skills as a covert operative in a series of interactive challenges. Book your visit today at spymuseum.org. Two balls, not good for pitchers. And if you're chafing, worse for itchers. Cool your strike zone with new Tommy John underwear. In Tommy John, you're that much more comfortable, so you can do everything better. With over 20 million pairs sold, Tommy John doesn't have customers. They have fanatics. Everything's backed by Tommy John's best pair you'll ever wear or its free guarantee. Get 20% off your first order now at TommyJohn.com slash Spotify. Save 20% at TommyJohn.com slash Spotify. See site for details. So this is not the first hearing this year. The mayor was not invited to the first hearing. That At that one, the chairman of the D.C. Council, Phil Mendelson, was there. One of the more outspoken council members, Charles Allen, was there. The city's chief financial officer was there. And the head of the police union That's right. was there. Can you give us the highlights or the lowlights or whatever kind of lights you want to give us? Yeah, you know, it, it, you had both Mendelson and Allen kind of being attacked by the Republicans over what the Republicans call the soft on crime, crime bill, you know, one of the more memorable moments that ended up on a lot of the late night comedy shows and ended up in memes was Marjorie Taylor Greene going after Charles Allen. Charles Allen was there because he at the time was the chairman of the Public Safety Committee, and he was the one who was tasked with overseeing the rewrite of the criminal code. And if you remember, she went after Charles Allen for wanting to to decriminalize public urination. And it was this back and forth, you know, she kept hammering, you you voted to decriminalize public urination. And Alan kept saying, no, I didn't. But what was so interesting to me about that is that Marjorie Taylor Greene was right. She was just asking the question incorrectly. In the original draft of the new criminal code, public urination was decriminalized. It was one of the things that popped up early and became part of the debate. And it was one of the things that by the time it got out of committee and got to the council as a whole to vote on, it was no longer in there. So Charles Allen was completely Meaning you you could get a ticket for peeing in public, but you couldn't get arrested. That's right. And Charles Allen answered her question truthfully. He did (laughs) not vote for that. And she kept saying, you did vote for that. He said, I didn't vote for it. It wasn't in it. If she just had somebody you know, who was paying close enough attention on her staff to whisper in her ear, 
to say, did you ever support that? Was it originally in the bill? She would have had a much different dialogue with him. But that was one of the moments that came out of it. But, you know, there was nothing really of substance that came out. You know, people got to go up and make their case, whether they be Republicans or Democrats. The people on the panel did their best to put their case forward. Greg Pemberton has been an outspoken critic of the Bowser administration and some of the legislation, the crime bill and other legislation that had already passed that would make, for instance, police officers disciplinary record public for people to see. And they very and Bowser and Conti oppose that. Say that makes it harder for them to hire police officers. So that's what Mm -hmm. you'll see Republicans going after Conti, I'm guessing, and trying to pin him down on you've got a council that wants to release all these records. Is that making your officers leave and making the city less safe? People who've been around D.C. a long time know that the committees in the Congress that oversee the district uh, have always been you know, a public enemy for D.C. patriots. Uh, but up in the congressional context, these committees have historically not been a place where they put the rising stars, right? Who is up there and are they as low wattage as the historic reputation has been? Well, you know, Comer is the chairman of the committee, the Republican, and he certainly makes a name for himself. You know, they have other oversight responsibilities that get them in the news as well. And of course, I mentioned Marjorie Taylor Greene is probably a household name in, in, in the country. She she gets a lot of notice. So um, they're making the best of a bad committee, right? I mean, this isn't a committee that normally gets a lot of headlines, particularly when they're doing oversight of the District of Columbia. But now they are. So I, I think, you know, publicity wise and status wise, they're making the, the best out of this committee, which you correctly point out, isn't something that people, when they get there, sign up and say, oh, that's the committee I want to be on, you <laughs> right. know, not science and technology. You know, I want to be House Oversight Committee over the District of Columbia. I don't think it's probably a coincidence, but the district had a public safety hearing last week. It feels sort of intentional that the mayor would set that up right before she's getting hauled up to Congress. What came out of that? Absolutely nothing. It was a dog and pony show. What Mayor Bowser will have that she alluded to at that hearing and subsequently announced is that new legislation that she's putting forth that would change the presumption clause where it would require judges to, if you have a violent offender, somebody charged with a violent offense who is a past violent offender, so this would be a repeat of violent offender with new charges, Uh, the judge would have to hold them in custody until their trial. Right now, the vast majority of them are released pending trial, and there is some anecdotal evidence that they reoffend while they're out. Some of them certainly do reoffend while they're out awaiting trial. And so Mayor Bowser very much has said that she wants those people to to actually stay in jail while they're awaiting trial, and she's going to put forth legislation, she has put forth legislation that the council will vote on to do. The one thing that kind of came out of that public safety hearing that the public was not allowed to attend was <laughs> a question from Trayon White, the council member from Ward 8, asking about a Washington Post report that the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, declined to prosecute in 2021, the most recent figures they had, 67% of all arrests were what is called no papered, which means they just were not prosecuted. People were released, never showed up on the record and nothing was ever done about it. And Trayon White confronted the U.S. attorney who was there, Matt Graves, and asked him, what's the disconnect? Why is this happening? And Graves gave a couple of answers. He said, one, D.C.'s crime lab, which lost its accreditation a while back and is now closed, cannot test drugs. And he said, a lot of these are misdemeanor drug cases. If I can't prove it's cocaine, I can't charge you in a court and convict you of possession or distribution of cocaine. So those cases are not getting uh, prosecuted. Then he also pointed to the D.C. Police Department and said, oftentimes they don't have the probable cause. The stop that they make to originally arrest someone and search someone is unconstitutional. And so when they recover a gun or they recover evidence, that evidence gets thrown out and they can't make a case in court. Mayor Bowser pushed back and pointed out that the federal government has plenty of resources and drug testing uh, laboratories Mm -hmm. that they could get the drugs tested if they wanted to pay for it and do it themselves. They clearly don't want that. Conti said if a case is not prosecuted, it doesn't mean a police officer did something wrong, but didn't really speak directly to like that at times his officers are making unconstitutional stops in the words of the U.S. attorney. But beyond that, it was 
four or five hours of posturing of people talking to themselves, patting themselves on the back, wanting to appear as if they were working on something. But the fact is, all the people who were in that room meet and talk regularly anyway. They didn't need to get together for, a, again, I say public with air quotes because the public wasn't invited. Portions were live streamed. The press was invited. We were in there, um, but no public was. So Axios reported last week that Mendelssohn says that there needs to be more of a presence in the federal world. He was blaming Bowser for not doing more to win friends and wield influence, particularly on the Hill. He's apparently hired a staffer to set up some meetings with Comer, the Republican who heads the Oversight Committee. Uh, is that a legit criticism? It's 100 percent legit. To Mendelssohn's point, Mayor Bowser does not have a good relationship with the federal government, certainly not with the White House. At this point in his administration, Mayor Bowser had met twice face to face privately with President Trump, once in the Oval Office, once up in New York City. She has yet to meet privately one on one with Joe Biden, a Democrat. Perhaps it's because she endorsed Mike Bloomberg. Perhaps it's because she called out for the National Guard to deal with the migrant bus crisis and has basically parroted what Republican governors are saying, that the migrant bus crisis is a federal responsibility and that President Biden should address it at the federal level and it shouldn't be left to local jurisdictions to deal with this influx of all these people. But for whatever reason, she doesn't have a good relationship with the White House. You don't see her talking to members of Congress. Look, when you go back years and you had, you know, Mayor Fenty working on the legislation to get D.C. a vote in, in the House through the Davis bill, you had, you had this great relationship with Tom Davis, a Republican from Virginia. Now, you know, many people say Tom Davis is progressive, forward thinking, you know, different, different Republican di Party, di different Republican Party, who famously said as he left, the Republican Party gave him the middle finger on his way out. But nonetheless, there was a dialogue, um, and you just don't see that. Tom Sherwood, who asked the mayor recently, who is your guy? Who do you have as a liaison between you know, your office and Capitol Hill, your office and the White House? And Mayor Bowser said, we'll get you that name. We'll put you in touch with that person, right? <laughs> well, wait, so if she were to find that person or personally become a uh, person who's uh, on a charm offensive and takes meetings and sits down with, particularly on the Hill with the majority there. Do you think that would do any good no. uh, given where the incentives are? No, you, you know, we have a completely different landscape now. I'm not saying she shouldn't try. She shouldn't establish some types of relationships with Republicans and Democrats up there to get whatever done she can do. But she right now does not have that. But the fact remains that you have a Congress that's polarized. You have a Republican, particularly Republican House, that has proven that they want to take an activist role in the District of Columbia, which for some of them is not new. You know, District of Columbia voted, the residents voted to legalize marijuana. Marijuana would otherwise be legal. You could go buy it just like you can in many other states. But Congress has prevented D.C. from spending any local dollars to implement that law. And that's been going on for years. You go back to the 80s and 90s when Congress did the same thing with needle exchange. They refused to let the District of Columbia pay for needle exchange. They refused to let them use federal dollars for abortion. So that kind of you know low-level meddling, if you will, uh, has been going on for some time. Now you see them taking a much more aggressive role. The blocking of the crime bill was a big, big deal. Biden went along with it. They, they played right into the Republicans' narrative of what, you know, they saw as, you know, a week on crime legislation by the D.C. Council. And I think they all admitted they never read the bill. So if I had a back alley that needed paving or something, you think I could call Comer's office and get some action? There was a movement in years past to do that, to call members of Congress with those kind of complaints <laughs> to kind of point out, like, look, if you want to legislate in D.C., if you want to play this role in D.C., yeah, you can, you can help get my trash picked up. You can help with potholes and whatnot. And the activist group D.C. Vote has advocated for that kind of stuff and, and have gone and had sit-ins in the offices of some of these uh, members of Congress who have, have tried to do this. But I will say, I don't feel like there's this angst and momentum amongst the district residents themselves 
to really get out in the streets and take Congress to task for this. Um, before the last hearing, there was maybe a couple dozen protesters outside the building making themselves heard. There's not a lot of foot soldiers in this battle. So let me ask, the criminal code reform bill, was, right. most of it was kind of mundane and unobjectionable. Is there anything going to come of that? So Brooke Pinto, who now chairs that committee, uh, was asked, when are we going to see a redo of this? And she would not put any kind of a date. I mean, certainly not this year. They're going to recommission the commission that originally put together the crime bill, and they're going to try to tweak it and fashion it. Mayor Bowser has said as they do this, they want to work with the Republicans on Capitol Hill so they can avoid the face off again and kind of get their input as they go along. The fact is that the narrative that the Republicans painted, the people who didn't like and others who didn't like that crime bill, a lot of it wasn't really based in fact. But yeah. Charles Allen and Council Chairman Mendelson, they let the narrative get away from them. the public urination stuff, you know, reducing the penalties for carjacking. That narrative got away from them. They weren't able to get out there fast enough and say, well, no, no, you know, we changed, you know, there used to, used to be one penalty. Now there's various grades of penalties and, and they're still higher than they are in other states. And well, right. And a lot of these very red members of Congress come from states with pretty appalling rates of violence and crime. Correct. And my guess is that you'll see Mayor Bowser armed with that kind of data so that she can push back and say specifically, Congressman so-and-so, here's the numbers in your jurisdiction. Here's what's happening that. in your hometown. But I will say, I do know Mayor Bowser seriously considered not going, not accepting the invitation, knowing that it wouldn't be fruitful, that she'd be speaking to a wall and that they were going to do to her just what they did to council members Allen and Mendelssohn in the last time. But she decided she will go. She's a very capable person. She knows the facts. She's good at, at stating the case for the District of Columbia. Robert Conti will stand there as a, you know, a real cop and a decorated officer, a native Washingtonian. There are few people who can speak as eloquently about law enforcement as Robert Conti can. Mark, thank you very much. Michael, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. And before you go, here is some quick news. Prince George's County Public Schools are suing Instagram, TikTok, and other social media apps for allegedly contributing to a youth mental health crisis. The school district wants the companies to pay for prevention, education, and treatment for social media addiction. They also want to see more safety features added to the apps. Also, the Army is still working to identify a mysterious liquid found in a World War I-era weapon discovered three weeks ago in Fort Totten Park in Northeast D.C. It is still unclear if this is at all connected to the chemical weapons found years ago near American University. They will keep analyzing the substance to determine whether a major cleanup might be required at the park. In the meantime, tell your kids not to play with landmines they may find. And finally, if you are a pickleball fanatic, your summer just got a little better. This weekend, Kraken Courts and Skates opened in Northeast DC. The venue has a bunch of fun activities, including a tavern, indoor lawn games, 14 pickleball courts, and DC's only indoor roller skating rink. This totally fits my theory that DC is a big playground for adults, and we did a whole episode on that. So check out our show notes to listen to that one. That's all for today here on CityCast DC. If you enjoyed the show, why not write your favorite Republican congressman along with your request that your nearby pothole be filled? You can also subscribe to our morning newsletter. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Bye. Bye.